But let's begin reading here in Acts chapter 1 at verse 1. I'll read to verse 8, and we'll get into our study. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And so I'm going to give to you some information, some basic information concerning the book of Acts. Then we're going to move into verses 1 through 8, and we're going to be looking at the uh, introduction to our study of the book of Acts. Now, when you look at the book of Acts, I want you to notice how it says the former in verse 1, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach. The book of Acts is the second book that was written by the writer Luke. Luke wrote the book of Luke, Luke or the gospel according to Luke, as well as the book of Acts. We know that when we study scripture that this man Luke was a friend and traveling companion of the apostle Paul. That will be noted when we get into chapter 16, verse 10. From some of the things that you can glean from, uh, from, from Acts and all and the things that are said of him, we know that Luke was a Gentile. It's, it's probable that he came from Antioch in Syria. So as such, Luke is the only Gentile writer contributing to the Bible. Now, we know that he served with Paul because Philemon, verse 24, uh, speaks of Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, and he's referred to there as a fellow laborer. We know according to Colossians chapter 4, verse 14, that he is a beloved physician. So as a physician or a doctor, he highlighted many of the healings in his gospel, and you're going to see that he highlights healings also in the book of Acts. Now, when he was writing the book of Acts, Luke relied on various sources for his information. We know that he pulled from written sources, as we will see when we get into chapters 15 and 23. And we also know that he interviewed eyewitnesses in the same way that he did when he wrote his gospel, because you see that in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Now, Paul's subsequent ministry, a second imprisonment that we see in 2 Timothy 4, and his death are not recorded. He doesn't mention the death of James. He doesn't speak of Nero's persecution, and he doesn't speak of the fall of Jerusalem. So we know that the book of Acts is, in reality, a documentation of the life of the early church. It provides a backdrop of how things began, and it also gives us information concerning how the Lord moved when the church was new. This book has been the book that has actually been the model for many ministries, including our own. When you look at what is called the dis distinctives that make us a Calvary ministry, you'll see that according to the distinctives, the book of Acts is, is really a blueprint for us. And there's a reason why. It's when you begin to look at the history of the church, when you begin to see the history of the church, much of the early history of the church up to, up to today is really tragic. You see, by the end of the first century, the church was already in very poor shape. How do we know that? Well, when you read the book of Revelation, which was written in the you know, 90, 90, 96 uh, AD, when you look at the book of Revelation, there are seven churches that are mentioned in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. 
And of these seven churches that are mentioned there by Jesus himself, five of the churches are already receiving condemnation of, uh, by the Lord. And so the church is birthed in around 33 AD, 32, 33 AD, but within 60 years, it's already going down the tubes. It's already having problems. And so by the time you read Revelation, you see that the Lord is speaking concerning some things that he's not, not pleased with. You can see how, how Jesus speaks of how they left their first love, how they had begun to accept compromise, greed, and undisciplined living, how they had set up a priesthood over the believer, and how they had allowed false doctrine to enter into the church. That all took place within the first 60 years or so of the history of the church. And so when you read Revelation, you see that Jesus declares that he's ready to remove his presence from them, he's ready to resist them, to abandon them to tribulation, to come upon them like a thief. He said that they were dead, lukewarm, wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, and that he was ready to spew them out of his mouth. This all took place within the first 60 years or so of the history of the church. The interesting thing about it, and we'll be looking at that in the book of Acts, is when you see the origin of the church, it was a work that was birthed by and sustained by the Spirit of God. The book of Acts gives us insight into how to be led as well as empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so as we go through this particular book, one of the things I'm going to be encouraging us to is to learn how to walk in the Spirit. You see, its purpose was to document church history, showing how the church began in order that it might fulfill what has been called the Great Commission. You've heard the term the Great Commission. The Great Commission is the marching orders that the church received from Jesus Christ. The Great Commission is His command for the church to enter into the world with the intention of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are people today, though, who will say, well, why do you want to even continue preaching this gospel? Why do you think it's necessary? Don't all roads lead to God? And the answer is, all roads, in a sense, do lead to God because every man will stand before God to give an account of himself. But not every religion leads you to heaven. And so the message of the gospel is a message that gives to us clarity concerning how you can arrive in heaven. And Jesus Christ gave to us this gospel, and he said, take it to the whole world and proclaim this message. This is a message that we have, a message of freedom that you have in Jesus Christ. In, in the book of Luke, in chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, uh, we read, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And so Jesus' mission was to do this, to bring people to faith in him so that they might enter into the kingdom of God. And so the word of Christ gives life to those who are spiritually dead in trespasses and sins. In John 5, 24 and 25, and Jesus said, most assuredly, I say unto you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life, shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. And so the spiritually dead are made alive as they invest their faith in Christ, receive his life, and those who are at one time dead in their trespasses and sins are made alive through Jesus Christ by his message and faith in him. So is the message of the gospel important? And the answer, biblically, is absolutely. Of course it's important. You see, the church received marching orders. And those orders, again, are called the Great Commission. This commission was given various times. You actually see it in John 20, verses 21 through 23. You see Mark 16, verses 14 through 18. And you also see it in Luke 24, verses 46 through 49. But what we associate with this Great Commission most readily is what is found in Matthew 28. All of you are familiar with this, because in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, it says, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. 
That's the Great Commission. Go out and make disciples. Teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And the mark or the demonstration that they are my disciples is that you will baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Your Great Commission to go out and proclaim this message. And so what we have here is once again Jesus giving another facet, an aspect of this Great Commission. Again, it's been said that the Great Commission was given in Matthew 28, but I just alluded to the fact that it's actually given in various ways in, in the other Gospels as well as here in the book of Acts because when we get to verse 8, he says, you shall receive power. After that, you have, uh, after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So once again, the four Gospels as well as the book of Acts, you have a commission. You have Jesus saying, I'll be with you always to the end of the age. In the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8, he's telling us it's the power of the Holy Spirit that is combining with the gospel message that transforms people's lives. We'll be seeing that as we go through the book of Acts. Now, he begins in verse 1, and I'm going to continue giving a little bit of uh, introductory comments, and then I'm going, to, I'm going to move into some things that I hope are practical uh, for us as believers. But again, I'll begin slowly and move on to our really slow. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began, both to do and teach. Luke begins by referring to the former account. The former account I made, O Theophilus. The former account would be the gospel of Luke. He's speaking of something that he had written earlier. So he says this former account would be the gospel. But he also is writing, notice with me, with me to a man by the name of Theophilus. Theophilus literally can be translated friend of God. That's what it literally means. Now, there are those who would say, is this a, a real person or is this simply a title? Is this a, a real person or is it speaking of the church in general because we, through Christ, have become friends of God? Uh, but more than likely, he's speaking to an individual by the name of Theophilus, a, a man who would be called what, a, what would have been called during that time a patron, somebody who was supplying funds to him in order that he might be able to give the account of the life of Jesus Christ. And so it would be as if Luke had been hired to accumulate all this information, which is what he did. And so he refers to the former account, which would be the gospel, and now a continuation of that account, which is the book of Acts. And so this is written to a man by the name of Theophilus, who more than likely was the individual who had hired him to go out and collect these things and then give the information to him. Now, I want you to notice something. I want you to see how it says, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Began both to do and to teach. That tells us that God's work is intended to continue. He began to do these things, but he continues to work amongst men. He intends this work to continue until his return in power and glory. Now, remember in Matthew, in chapter 16, verse 18, how Jesus said to the apostle Peter, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. The church is intended to continue influencing people for God until Jesus returns. And Jesus' influence is to continue after he died, was buried, and resurrected. But how could this influence continue if he's physically gone? It's going to continue through the power and the presence of the Spirit in the body of Christ. Notice how he says in verse 2, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. And so through the Holy Spirit, he had given commandments uh, to the apostles whom he had chosen. Now, we know that the Holy Spirit is the source of Jesus' power while Jesus was walking on the face of the earth. Matthew 12, 18 says, Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. So Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit, and it's the same Holy Spirit that continues to work 
after Jesus has ascended. Now, in John 14, verses 16 and 17, Jesus said, I will pray the Father, he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. With you and in you. So it's the Holy Spirit who empowers believers to be witnesses of Jesus to the world. What is it that we testify? And we're going to see this, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself in my notes, but we're going to see this. He says, you shall be my witnesses. What is it that we testify? What are we witnessing? We're witnessing the reality of the fact that Jesus Christ died, was buried, but he rose again from the dead. Listen, people don't have a problem. Many people don't have a problem saying, well, I'll give you that Jesus Christ may have lived on the face of the earth. Yes, there may have been a teacher. There may have been a prophet of the, of the nation of Israel. Uh, there may have been a good man by the name of Jesus. I'll give you that. And so you can speak to them concerning Jesus, and you can speak to them concerning how good he was and how kind he was, how loving he was, how gentle he was. As a matter of fact, you and I, those of us who share our faith or speak to people concerning Christ, we know that there are many people who are out there in the world today who will grant to you that there was someone like Jesus, but the, the problem is, is they only agree with Jesus insofar as he agrees with them. And so what happens is when, when you say something like, but Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me, that's where they have a problem. They'll say, listen, I, I think Christmas is fine. You know, it's a nice time to think of family and to give presents and receive presents. All you got to do is watch some of the programs today where they have man on the street interviews. And, and uh, just the other day, I was watching a program where somebody is saying to these people on the street, he's saying to them, what is Christmas? And they'll tell you, oh, it's a time for family. It's a time for meals. It's a time for us to get together and exchange gifts. But what does it celebrate? It celebrates family, it celebrates goodness, it celebrates love, it celebrates peace. It ce What's it celebrate? See, an older generation would say, I know exactly what it celebrates because the older generation had Christmas carols in classrooms. The first time I ever sang in a choir was not in a church. The first time I ever sang in a choir was at William W. Orr School in Norwalk, California. It was a, an elementary school. We had a Christmas play every year, and the kids would get together, and we would sing Silent Night, Away uh, in the Manger. We would sing Christmas, traditional Christmas carols that would celebrate the reality of the birth of the Savior. There were stores that were all closed on Christmas Day. You didn't go to, Christmas, to, uh, to any stores on Christmas Day because they were all closed. The nation basically was shut down on Christmas to commemorate the birth of Jesus Christ. And that's why older people know that. They'll, you speak to an older person, speak to somebody 60 years old. What is Christmas? They'll say, well, they celebrate the birth of Christ. If they can remember who they are, they'll remember that. <laughs> but they'll say that to you. And a lot of people, you know, a lot of people know exactly what I'm saying uh, by experience. Because it was a slow turn, but it finally did occur where you stopped saying Merry Christmas and you started saying Happy Holidays. That was a slow turn, but it took place. And, and to me, again, you know, and this is not trying to celebrate the good old days. I'm just trying to make a point how things can change when you reject the person Christ. I can still remember watching Christmas specials with Jewish men like Jack Benny and others who had people singing away in the manger, giving gospel messages. They weren't upset. They weren't offended. They didn't say happy holidays. That did not exist. That has recently existed within the last several years. That has made people like you feel like, oh gosh, while well, they're trying to make you feel like you're harsh and unloving and, and not caring, when in fact what it is, it's a rejection of who Jesus Christ is. And listen, the gospel of Jesus Christ influenced the church, influenced the society, 
influenced television, influenced movies. I was sharing just, uh, just today with somebody, I was saying, you realize that when the mo motion, what are called motion pictures, when movies were first beginning to be presented, you realize that the original movies, many of the original movies were actually gospel presentations so that people would hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. That even in the 40s, the most popular radio program that was played on Sunday nights, I think it was called something like, um, I, I can't remember, I want to call it Back to the Bible, but it, or the Old Time Gospel Hour, it was something like that. It was the number one listened to radio program on Sunday nights. The nation would listen to gospel messages as a nation on Sunday nights for years and years and years. See, the things that we're seeing today in our society are really just outward rejections of who Jesus Christ is. And the church has got to be careful that we don't hide Jesus somewhere and, not, and that he may not be found. He has to be openly presented. And so what makes the church powerful has not simply been the ability to present a message. The message in and of itself, of course, is God's powerful message. I'm not denigrating that. But it is the power of the Holy Spirit within the body of Christ that takes this powerful message, presents it through the anointing of Christ, and sees transformation. And that's what God would have for the church all through its ages, all through the lifetime of the church. And so... Jesus had said to his men, the Holy Spirit will be with you and the Holy Spirit will be in you. And he was given to them a promise of the Holy Spirit who in the Old Testament would rest upon but depart. You see, you see King David as he says, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. You see Samson who knew not that the Spirit had departed from him. You see King Saul, the Spirit had departed from him. Because in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would rest upon, empower, but would also leave. In the New Testament, Jesus says, no, he will be with you and he will be in you. And that's how you become a Christian. See, a lot of people think they're Christians because they go to church. They think they're Christian. Well, we're going to have a whole lot of people visiting us on Christmas because Christians go to church. And then I'll see them next year. Or in Easter, because you go at least twice, right? And then you go to funerals, and you go to weddings. So yeah, I'm a good Christian. And so a lot of people think that way. America, by and large, has moved in that direction. But it's the Holy Spirit, and we'll look at this. I'm, I'm just giving you a little bit of an introduction. I'll get there in a moment. It's the Holy Spirit who empowers believers to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. What is it that we are witnessing? I will be your witness concerning your resurrection. Now, in verse 3, he presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them. So we testify that Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. It's not just that he was a good man. It's not that he was just a good teacher. It's not even that he was a prophet. It's that he was resurrected from the dead. That's what we speak about. And when we get to Acts chapter 2, verse 32, it says that this Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. So Jesus was with them over a 40-day period. He instructed them concerning the work of God as he rules in the lives of believers. And uh, we'll see that in, in, uh, again when we get into chapter 2. It says in verse 4 and 5, um, being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so what we have first is a promise. Jesus often spoke of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is spoken of here as, notice, the promise of the Father. So in order to successfully accomplish the task of being witnesses, power is required. In the Old Testament book of Joel, in chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, it says, Afterward, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. 
even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. That's the promise of the Father. In Luke 24, 49, Jesus said, I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. So one, we have a promise, and the promise is the promise of the Father. And so one, he has stated, I will fulfill that promise that you have in the Old Testament and that I reiterated in the New, this promise that the Holy Spirit will come upon you. He moves into verse 5, and I'll just touch it lightly, where he says, John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. John's baptism. John's baptism was of water. He was preparing people to meet Messiah. Later on in the book of Acts, in chapter 19, verse 4, we see John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, Jesus. So you have John's baptism, but Jesus' baptism is called the baptism of the Spirit. It's going to take place on Pentecost. In, Ma in, in Matthew 3, verse 11, he said, uh, John said, I baptize you with water for repentance. After me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. I'm going to look at that when we get to verse 8 and verse 6. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, shut up. <laughs> You're always asking dumb questions. No. He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Remember... Those of you who've been with me in uh, the book of Matthew, remember in chapter 19 how Jesus had said to his men, you shall be seated on thrones judging. Well, in the minds of the apostles, they really didn't have yet the revelation of what is called the church age. So when Messiah died, was buried, and resurrected, as they understood it through the rabbinic teachings many had been saturated with, their belief eschatologically would have been that Messiah would instantly become the ruler. And that's why they wanted to know whether his promise that he had made in, in Matthew in, in chapter uh, 19, verse 28, uh, if that promise was being fulfilled. And so Jesus immediately says to them, this isn't something that you need to know about. You see, they knew that Jesus would establish a literal earthly kingdom because he had taught that he would. In the Old Testament, in Psalm 2, verse 6, it says, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. But the exact moment of the reign is not to be revealed to them. You see, in Mark 12, rather Mark 13, verse 32, he said, No one knows the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, only the Father. So he said, This is not something for you to be asking questions about because I have something else for you. And then he speaks in verse 8. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. I want to spend some time looking at this. Again, Jesus had spoken about the Holy Spirit being with you and in you. With the Holy Spirit working within you and having fellowship with Him, you have the capacity to be led by the Spirit and you become the temple of the Spirit of God and thus you're no longer a religious person but you are now made into a genuine Christian. When Jesus was speaking of the works of the Spirit, he said he'll be with you, he'll be in you. But he also speaks, and I want to look at this for a moment with you, of how the Holy Spirit will be upon you. How the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the Holy Spirit will come upon you with power. The Holy Spirit, when he comes upon you with power, is going to also fill you with the fruit of the Spirit. 
You will also have the ability to exercise the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And you're going to evidence that you have a relationship with God through the transformation that takes place by the Holy Spirit. You're going to be born again. You're going to have a relationship with God that is going to be overt. People are going to know there's something different about you because the Spirit of God is going to dwell within you, but He's also going to empower you. And this is one of the areas that I really believe there's so much confusion about that there are a lot of people who've actually become a bit afraid of opening themselves up to the Holy Spirit. There have been people who's, who have said, I don't know if I want all that God has for me because what if he sends me to some place I don't want to go? Or what if he has me give up something that I want to keep? What if he wants me to do something that I don't want to do? Whenever God guides for you, he always provides for you. Whenever the Lord moves you, it's because he has placed in your heart this sense that he will meet you. Many years ago when I was a, a new believer, I, had, I was going to Biola, and um, I had a friend of mine who was placed in uh, student ministries, and he was overseeing outreaches. And there were two particular outreaches he was overseeing. One was to Watts, and the other was to a place called Ramona Gardens. So he asked one of the African-American kids, friends, will you oversee the work in Watts? And this, this young African-American brother said, yeah, of course. And he began to do ministry in Watts. At that time, Watts was heavily African-American, and this brother had ministry there, and he felt that it would be good because uh, they'd be able to work together well there. And on, then my friend approaches me and says, will you go to Ramona Gardens? I said, no. <laughs> Are you kidding me? You're looking at an ex-hippie. I was never a cholo. What are you talking about? <laughs> you see, I, I, I know this could be offensive if I don't say it right. It can be offensive if I say it right. <laughs> know my heart as I say it, and you'll understand what I'm trying to say. When I first got saved, I said, Lord, I'll do anything, but Lord, I know that I'm Mexican-American. We used to refer to ourselves as Chicano. I know that that's what I am. But Lord, I, I didn't grow up in the projects. I didn't grow up in a barrio. I didn't grow up in that. That's just not who I am. You know, when, when the hippie movement came, I, I was in heaven because I was anti-violence. You know, I didn't like, you just kind of mellow and let's just be cool and smoke dope and, you know, just enjoy life, you know, drink wine, you know. So, Lord, I'll go anywhere except to gangs. Here's my friend Jimmy. David, will you go to Ramona Gardens? <laughs> Charlie. No, I said, I, I, I said, I said, no. I said, no. I said, what? He said, will you go to Ramona Gardens? Ramona, some of you know Ramona. It's still a tough place. It's still a tough place. Will you go to Ramona Gardens? And I, I have to be, I'm be real with you. I, I, I went home and I said, Lord, I want to serve you. And I have told you, whatever you want for me to do, I will do. But you know that I had that restriction on the contract. <laughs> Long story made short, I began to minister in Ramona Gardens. I don't know why I was nervous. I still to this day don't know why. I just was. The first day we came, we pulled up in a bus and, you know, a little yellow bus with all of these oh, people climbing on out. We're from Biola, you know. And, and this guy, I guess, I guess he thought he was the neighborhood bad guy, walks up to me. Well, he walks up to all of us. He just comes walking up. And he says, who's in charge here? I looked around. <laughs> And 
And I walked up to him and I said, well, I am. I'm leading this group. What are you doing here? First thing, challenge. What are you doing here? I said, I don't know. You want us to leave? <laughs> no, I said, get on the bus. <laughs> We're out of here. Let's go to the beach. <laughs> what are you doing here? I said, we're here to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ to this community. We're here to minister to your children. We're coming with a team of people that can give them crafts, can sing with them. We're going to play games with them. We're committing our lives to them so that we can communicate to them, especially the life-changing message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we're doing here. And he looks at me. And he gives me that look like, are you real? And he says, if anybody asks you, you tell them so-and-so says, you're OK. And I said, great, of course. See, I already knew a guy named Chewy, also known as Jesus, was, we're OK. I, I already knew that. I already knew that. But the bo bottom line, and I'm trying to be, <laughs> I'm enjoying myself. I shouldn't. I should be real serious. But <laughs> listen, when God moves you someplace, he's with you all the way. And you, can't, you, cannot walk into, you cannot walk into areas that you're uncomfortable with without the peace of God that passes all understanding. And you can't be effective in areas that you are feeling unequipped for without the power of the Holy Spirit who gifts you and gives you the words to speak. And you need to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. We are saved and we receive the Holy Spirit's seal in our life. But Jesus said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So I, I want all that the Lord has for me. I, I want to walk in the fullness of his spirit. I want to sense his presence in my life. I, I want to live by the spirit in order that, as he says in Galatians 5, 16, I will not gratify the sinful desires of my flesh. You see, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will come upon you with power and he's going to fill you with love. He's going to fill you with his goodness. You will be his witnesses. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit is what made the church a powerful witness throughout its history. The most powerful witness has always been the transformed lives that occur because of the gospel being received and the power of the Holy Spirit transforming a person and being present in the way that they live. You see, today... If you don't mind, I think I can speak with some authority on this. I've been around for a while. Today, my concern, and it is a great concern, a great concern for the church because I love the church, not just this fellowship. I love the church, the body of Christ. And my great concern is that many today are confusing the work of the Holy Spirit with the with the efforts of human flesh. And so we say that we're going to church, and, and while we're there, we, uh, you know, we're in this visible location, and we'll say God is really moving because we have a new building, or, or God is present because we have a great band, uh, or God is really reaching people because we have good programs. Or God is really moving on my pastor because he's got such a personality. How did God move before without, you know, without fog machines, without lights, without the net? How did he move? How did these people go in and they had the reputation that they were turning the world upside down? How'd that happen without the winning personalities? Listen, Paul is the greatest mind that the church ever had. But when he preached, a guy named Eutychus fell asleep and 
fell out of the window and died. <laughs> when the Corinthians spoke about Paul, they said, oh, he's, he's a paper, paper tiger. You know, he writes weighty letters, but his presence is weak. His speech is contemptible. This guy is boring beyond words. This guy doesn't entertain us. And they said, read 2 Corinthians, and when you read 2 Corinthians, you will find no less than 21 accusations lodged against the Apostle Paul. No less than 21 accusations that he in 2 Corinthians had to answer. And they said he's just boring. They said he's ugly. They said everything that you can imagine about this man, and yet he was the greatest apostle taking the gospel of Jesus throughout the world. He said, I have made it my aim to proclaim the name of Christ where his name has never been preached, lest I should build on another man's foundation. This man, the Apostle Paul, who was breathing out threatenings for those who were followers of Christ, was radically transformed to a man who went everywhere for Jesus Christ. How did that happen? And can that happen today? And should that happen today? And has the church been deceived into thinking that we need certain things like the building, like the music, like the lights, like the entertainment, like the personality? And I have to say, absolutely. You know what we need? We need the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Word of God. That's what we need. I'm 20 years old once. I was talking to my wife about this just today. 20 years old. I know times have changed, and no, I'm not trying to match sin for sin. Forgive me if it sounds that way. When I grew up, there just wasn't that much dope use. There just wasn't. There weren't that many people who drank radically and smoked pot and dropped acid. That just wasn't happening. It was just beginning. California was never going to legalize marijuana. Are you kidding me? No, because a Californian was a conservative at that time. They actually loved God, apple pie, and the American flag. We didn't have athletes who said, I'm not going to stand for the national anthem. We didn't have any of that. We didn't have marches in the street the way we do now. It's changed in a way that some of you wouldn't understand. You wouldn't understand. So when I was growing up, I was one of the radical kids. I was one of those. I was the kid who stumbled down the street in a middle class neighborhood, loaded or drunk all the time. I was a thief. I was a liar. I was everything that, 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 that went along with the drugs and the alcohol. I didn't care about, I stole from stores. I would go to stores and I would walk out with armful of, of goods. I didn't even hide it. I just would walk between the, the clerks. I did that. I, I stole, I'd sell it and I'd buy dope with it. That's what I did. And I thought I was a Christian because I'd been baptized as an infant. I was a Catholic kid. I was a Christian. Don't tell me about Jesus Christ. I can tell you about Jesus Christ. That's how I was. But I wasn't uh, unlike a lot of people. There were a lot of people like me. My, all my friends were like me in one form or another. That's just the truth. And I'm having people say, you need, you need Jesus. And I'd say, I already got Jesus. I'm a Catholic. I'm a member of the very first church. Peter is the first pope. I knew my catechism. That's a fact. And I would argue. And so my friend invites me to go to this church called Calvary. And I walk in. And it's a church that was built to seat about 300. And there's about four or 500 people in that building. And I sit down. I, I can tell you where I was. I was sitting in the back. And I had the long hair. And I had smoked some pot and I had drank some beer, and I walked in barefooted, and I went in rebellious and angry, and I walked in there thinking, these hypocrites will kick me out in a, in a moment, just like they would at my church. Because if I'd have walked into St. Pius X Church in Santa Fe Springs like that, they would have escorted me out the door. 
That's a fact. We all know that. And you know that? When I went in there, I sat down, and I looked at all these hippie kids, and they're singing about God's love. And I'm looking around, and I'm thinking, this is weird. Because I actually like it. I actually like this. I didn't know what it was that I was feeling, but I do now. I was feeling conviction because I wasn't like these people. And I was feeling lonely because I didn't have God. And I was feeling the presence of an other that I only had heard about but didn't know personally, and that was the Spirit of God. And I experienced something that we used to sing and sing about. We used to say, all you need is love. And I was in the midst of hundreds of kids, and it hit me. I'm feeling in a church for the first time in my life, love. Love. It was not a, I'll let you do whatever you want because I love you, man. No. It was God's love. It was a sense that, it was a sense that I'm unworthy to be amongst these people. I'm not like these people. They have something I don't have. I didn't know exactly what it was then, but when I got saved, the light bulb went off, and I said, that's what it was. Jesus said, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he transforms you unrecognizable to those who know you best. Have you been changed like that? Or do people still think you're the same guy? Haven't changed at all. If you haven't changed, you haven't connected yet. You haven't. I always say this. Dumb. Some of you have heard it. All of you probably have. But for the one or two who hasn't, we had a project. We were working on a building. And I'm no construction worker, but they handed me a hammer. And I walked up and started ha hammering on a wall. And then they gave me a screwdriver, and I unscrewed a, a light switch. And I pulled the box off, and one of my boys walked up to me. They were little at the time, and I leaned my hand against the wall. And I was talking to them when I, I felt something, and I looked, and I, my, the wires had made connection on this finger here. So one of the wires is on one side of my fingernail, and the other was on the other side, and, they, and, I, and I connected. And I pulled my hand out, and my fingernail was on fire. I still, and I was a hippie, so I started going, That's a fact. I really go, ooh, look at that. <laughs> Ow. And I discovered something. When you make contact with power, you will know it. You will know it. There are a number of Christians today who are walking around with no power. You're constantly hurting, constantly sad, constantly remembering, hey, get over it. Look to Jesus. He transforms lives. That's Christianity. He forgives you of your sins. He makes you a new creation. He gives you the power to overcome, and you can overcome. I don't say that I am a, uh, a recovering alcoholic. I've been recovered by Jesus, man. I, you know, I, I am an entirely new creation because old things are passed away. See, I don't identify with the sin, the old sin. I identify with the new man that I became in Jesus Christ. And I know that because of the power of the Holy Spirit. And a lot of us today want to remain where we were. And we want people to give us permission to continue where we were. But Jesus doesn't. He says, you need to leave that behind and follow me. That's what God has called us to do. And you can't do that without the power of the Spirit. 
You can't. Some of you are frustrated because you've tried. I don't think there are very many people in this room who are more messed up than I was. And I don't say that with anything other than I don't think there are. You don't know my real testimony. But I'll tell you this. God is able. God transforms. God forgives. God empowers. That's Christianity. We do not hold to a philosophy. We hold to a savior, Jesus Christ. And when he is presented, people get saved. They get saved and they're transformed. You shall receive power. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. I will be with you. I will be in you. And my spirit will come upon you. You will be baptized in the power of the Holy Spirit. Witnesses of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit changing our life. There's an instant, we'll see this in chapter 4, how that the apostles performed a mighty work and people began to question them how this took place. And in Acts 4, verse 13, it says, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. You know, the history of the Calvary movement is that we, in the eyes of many, are uneducated and untrained. But the one thing they can't say about us, and they can say they're uneducated, and they can say they're untrained, they can. But another thing they can say is we've been with Jesus. And that's what the testimony is. They looked at them, they said, they haven't gone through our rabbinic schools, and these are individuals who haven't been trained in our ways, but... There's one thing that we know about them. They've been with Jesus. And guess what? They had been and they still were. The Holy Spirit wants to come upon you tonight. Jesus said you will receive power and the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The Holy Spirit wants to baptize you in order that you might walk in his power. And he wants to fill you. And we'll see this as we go through the book of Acts. He wants to fill you so that his presence might be there, his gifts and and graces will be there. And what happens is when you're baptized in the Spirit, you begin to walk and you begin to witness. Notice he said, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. You begin in your Jerusalem. I began with my family. I brought them to Christ. I began to share with my neighbors. I began to have Bible studies. And then I began to go to other cities. Even my ministry began here. We met in Ontario. We met in Montclair. We we met in Claremont. We went back to Ontario, came to Chino. In the city of Chino, we, we reach out of Chino. We, we train disciples, and uh, we reach other cities. Um, we have churches that have come out of this church in Ojai, in Ontario, in Southgate, Upland, Fontana, Montclair, Wairica. We have churches in Lake Havasu, in Great Falls, Montana, Corpus Christi, Texas, San Antonio, Madison, Wisconsin, and Clay Allen, Washington. Uh, we, we, we are wanting to reach people. Our studies are seen via the internet. They're on YouTube. Uh, we're beginning a podcast ministry to take this gospel out. We're on radio stations throughout the United States. I didn't even know this. I looked it up today. We're on radio stations in Arizona, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, uh, Indiana, Maine, Missouri, North Carolina, North Dakota, North, uh, New Jersey, New, New York, Nevada, Ohio, Oregon, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, South Dakota, Tennessee, Texas, Washington, uh, Wisconsin, and Hawaii. We, we're on in a variety of places. We're, we have internet radio uh, we, through many states. We, we're on a, a various things that right now. We have prison ministries. We have church in Mexico. God is doing neat things, and it's all through the Holy Spirit. It's all through Jesus' teaching. It's through the power of the Spirit. And that's what happens when you're obedient. You can do a great work because God is with you. You know, I was taught first by the Bible and then by the example of my pastor. If you strive to attain, you will strive to maintain. But walking in God's spirit is a way of life. Seeking his presence, hungering for his help. 
We need his spirit. We need his spirit today, guys, because the church in the United States is ashamed of the gospel. Ashamed. You know, there's a, a guy who influences me. His name is A.W. Tozer. And A.W. Tozer said this. He said, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we, what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference. Be careful. Be careful what you allow to influence you into believing that the Spirit of God is moving. Because sometimes it's all light and no fire. Sometimes it's just all noise, but not a message. Seek God. Seek God. Walk in his power. Every day, Father, in Jesus' name, fill me with your spirit. Every day, God, use me for your glory. Every day, God, change me. God, transform me. God, make me different. Every day. That's what I do every day. Every day. Every day. God, make me a better Christian. God, make me a better husband. God, make me a better father. God, make me a better grandfather. God, make me a better man. God, help me to be a pastor. God, help me to care for people. God, fill me with your spirit. Pray that way and watch what God will do. You'll never think you arrive, by the way. You'll always discover that you need him more. You'll always discover that. But what a place to be, dependent on the Lord. You shall receive power after the Spirit has come upon you. Oh, God, may we have your power.